Well, I can sense the excitement in the class already. And yet, you managed to all weekend, it's probably like Christmas is coming, right? Central Limit Theorem is coming. Central Limit Theorem is coming. Yeah, that's the yes. The cards today. Oh, man. You better send a text to yourself. It's actually going to take two days to get all the way through it. We'll savor it. We'll savor it. We'll uh, but first, kind of a background of what's it all about and why is it so important? Because actually, when we get to finally state, stating the central limit theorem, it's, it's pretty straightforward and simple as the mathematical theorems go. If you think about what we've done so far, we've been taking a little bit of a white line. You know the truth? <laughs> That's it. Uh, all those angel test scores. Nah. Double. <laughs> the problem is we've been solving. We said, well, this is mu, the population mean, and this is sigma, the population standard deviation. Go punch it in your calculator and you can get out of the number. You know what? In the real world, that's hardly ever going to happen because you don't know mean, the mean, mu, and the standard deviation sigma. And that's what we would like to know. And it's incredibly difficult to understand what those values would be. In some cases, it's just totally impossible or infeasible. So the little white lie is we make the problems far too simple. The reality out there in the messy real world is just not like that. Most of the time, your challenge is, what is me? The me, you. What is the standard deviation sigma? And once you have values for that, you can do all this stuff that's really easy. But the question is, well, how do I get those values to begin with? So these are some of the questions that I think motivate the discussion. I'll put it in context. So how do we get these estimates? And if I get an estimate, how do I know that, is there any way I can make a statement of how accurate it is? How good of an estimate is it? And in some of the parameters, like a mean, there's different ways I can estimate it. Which ones are better than the others? Do some have kind of the uh, good housekeeping seal of approval, and others just you know, stay away, don't use, or use a general risk? And what can I know about the distribution of my estimates? That's a little bit more abstract, but that will come in focus in a, in a few minutes here. All these kinds of questions are circulating it, and that's, we're going to try to answer most of these today. But first, I think it's a lot easier to understand mathematics if you have a concrete problem in mind. Because statistics is very application-oriented. Not all mathematics, but statistics is. So let's pretend. This is a thought experiment. Suppose you're a biology married major, a wildlife biologist, and you're studying, let's say, smallmouth bass in Rockbridge County, and you've got a lake. That's your sign to that lake, and you're to study the smallmouth bass population in that lake. And what are some things you might want to know about that? Griffin, what would you like to know about your fish in that lake? Um, how large they are. How large they are. Weight, length. Well, how are you going to find that out? Has to do with the <laughs> very, very astute. And this is statistics class. I bet it has to do with how would you how would you get a number that you would feel confident represented the mean length or weight of the, the small amount of bass in that lake? I used to get one or two very clever answers. Go ahead and say it. It's in the back of your mind. Day twenty. Oh, you're very practical. Someone usually says, drain the lake. Or throw a stick of dynamite. That would just get a helicopter. Get an old lake. It's like it's all Get a helicopter. <coughs> uh, okay, Rob. Not to make it too silly, though, you can see the challenges in, in this 
case, I don't even know how many fish are in there. It's infeasible or impossible for me to catch them all at one point in time and weigh them all. But I'd like to know something about that population. How can I go about doing that? And once I've made this estimate, can I say anything about how accurate it is? So what process would you work? I heard some, uh, Roscoe, you said you're going to catch 20 of them. And? And find the mean weight. Okay, he's going to take a sample of 20 and find the mean of that sample. <coughs> and that would be your estimate, right? The <coughs> estimate of the true population mean. Keep in mind this distinction, population sample. And this is a good example in that it's, there's no way we can know the true population mean, right? It's there in theory, but we can't, we can't measure it directly. So that's a reasonable approach. I'm going to take a sample, and I calculate the statistic. Those are x bars. And I would get a mean weight. And I can do that again. I can take a second sample of, we'll say 20 in our case, and get a, a mean weight in x bar 2. And each time I'll get a different number. How do I know which one of those to use? Or do I know which one to use? Which is the best one? Just use them all. In this sense, I could take the mean of the sample means, couldn't I? Sounds reasonable. But the mathematicians, we've got to demonstrate to yourself what really is going on here. If I take this kind of technique, is it really going to give me the result that I want? For example, is the mean of the sample means really the population mean? We don't know that. It kind of seems like it should be, doesn't it? Oh, we don't know that. Not yet. Okay, that's. Uh, Let's focus, before we go any further here, let's focus on vocabulary. And the next quiz, not, not announced today, maybe Wednesday, I'll announce it. I'll ask you to identify all of these terms. We've been through this a little bit previously. It's really important that you learn the language of statistics, especially now, because when we talk about something, we've got to be precise about what we mean. The general split of our universe is between populations and samples. And what we're observing, or what we like to know about a population, we call a parameter. That would be population mean, the variance, standard deviation, or proportion. I'm going to introduce that P, proportion. This is typically, these numbers are unknowable or not feasible to know. So we estimate them, and we estimate them with sample statistics. X bar is a sample statistic that estimates the population mean. S squared is a sample variance that estimates the true population sample variance, and so on. I don't think I formally introduced this one before, but we call it, that's P hat. It's a sample statistic, it's a sample proportion. So there, now you know P hat. Okay, so let's consider some more examples of these before we dive down into theory. Well, questions that uh, are asked a lot, uh, census statistics, what's the mean age of the U.S. population? That might be an interesting thing to know if you're doing uh, for planning for Social Security, right? Or benefits like that. It'd be nice to know how old are, are, is the population. Well, that mu, that mean age of the United States, all the citizens here, that exists, doesn't it? But I can't ever really calculate it. So we're going to estimate it using an X bar. A good example of a P or percentage or proportion would be an unemployment rate. Once a month, uh, all of the uh, Wall Street folks and other investment banks get really interested when the unemployment rate 
is announced. But that's really, are they announcing a P or a P hat? It's a P hat, it's an estimate. I mean, how could you actually know at any given time how many people are employed or not? You can't possibly. They have very complicated procedures to take a sample, come up with an estimate of P hat. Uh, manufacturing processes. Uh, consistency is a huge issue. And I'm using examples of clocks here just because it's more obvious. If I make, if I manufacture clocks, I want them to have a mean error of zero, don't I? But also like that standard deviation of their error to be really small. Just because the mean is zero doesn't mean the standard deviation is small, right? We went through examples like this way back at the start of the course. So a consistent manufacturing process, they're going to be interested in estimating sigma, the true standard deviation, with an S. The process we've talked about, that Roscoe introduced us to, is a sampling distribution. And the whole idea is I take a sample, I calculate a statistic, and then I do that again and again and again. This is the big picture. I can calculate, a sa I can create a sampling distribution of any of the statistics I just mentioned on that earlier slide. An X bar, an S squared, or an S, or a P hat. And the sampling distribution is what shape of a curve do I get? if I did this procedure hundreds of times, thousands of times, millions of times, keep catching those fish again and again and again. Each time I would get another X bar and I could put it in a histogram. And after doing that hundreds of thousands of times, I could make the width of the histograms really small and I could look at the shape of that. And it'd be really interesting to know what the shape of that distribution is. Because here's the really important thing to keep in mind. X is my random variable. When we are doing our sampling, we're taking 10 X's and then dividing it by N. That's the mean. X bar is also a random variable. Might not think of it that way, but it is. It's a random variable. We've calculated probabilities, haven't we, for normal random variables and binomials. What we like to do is understand what the distribution of X bar is like so we can calculate probabilities for X bar. That's where the central limit theorem is going to help us. How it's all fitting together. We've got a process that's going to help us get estimates for these things that we're interested about. But we know that each sample is itself a random variable. So it's got a distribution. What's that distribution look like? Stay tuned. It's going to get better. Another picture. This, this one is out of the book. Uh, <coughs> Very similar. This would be the sampling distribution of the sample means. Now that's the other thing I need to forewarn you of. In this next few sections, it takes a lot of words strung together in the right order to say something correctly and precisely. We are looking at the sampling distribution of the sample means right now. We could look at the sampling distribution of the sample variances or the sampling distribution of the sample proportions. We've got two <coughs> concepts there. A sampling distribution, taking a sample over and over again, calculating a statistic. In this case, it's a mean. Or I could do the same process for a different statistic. I would have a different sampling distribution. Okay. Now, when I have these estimators, this is going back trying to answer 
one of the first questions, are some of them better than other estimators? And the answer is yes. We can't get down to the details and demonstrate exactly why, so you're gonna have to uh, just take it as a leap of faith here. We're gonna classify them in two groups, unbiased and biased, and the estimators you want to use are the unbiased ones. X bar is an unbiased estimator of the mean. That's good. S squared is an unbiased estimator of sigma squared, and P hat is an unbiased estimator of P to the proportion. And those are the common ones we work with. So they have that seal of approval. Now what does unbiased mean? Well, I'm gonna wave the hands a little bit here, but generally it means I'm guaranteed that if my sampling distribution is large enough, I can get as close as I want to the real parameter, the real value. I can guarantee that if I work really, really hard, take a lot of samples, I can get as close as I want to the true value. That's a nice property to have. Not all estimators have that property. You don't always get that guarantee. But for these three, they have the gold stamp. Now I have to give you a little bit of a disclosure S, the sample standard deviation, is a biased estimator of sigma. Now again, we won't get into the particulars, but I'm going to put a little asterisk here. It is biased, but the bias isn't very large, so we tend to accommodate it and use it anyways. But if someone was to ask you a multiple choice set of questions on a test in your future, if someone was to do that and ask you which estimators are unbiased, <coughs> that's the list. Anything else that we've studied is biased. All right, now let's get to the the really interesting question. How close am I? Is there any possible way of knowing after we've got those 20 fish and we've weighed them and taken the average, is there any possible way of knowing how close I am to the real me? It sounds like it could happen. But we can. We can make a statement and we can know how close are with at least a probability, how likely it is that we're within a certain range of the mean. And the secret to getting the answer to that question is, again, I have to know the distribution of this new random variable, x bar. If I know that distribution, then I can answer the question like, I believe that 90% of the time, the sample mean that I just got is within 0.5 of the true mean. That's a pretty powerful statement to be able to make. I guess we'll finish those. So let's do a little bit of, uh, let's use our mathematical intuition here. I have my random variable x. It has a mean mu. And down here is my random variable x bar. It's the sample mean. Now when I do this, I have to keep n, I have to keep the sample size fixed. So that's one of the rules in our, in our work here. The sample size has to be fixed. What do you think the mean of x bar would be? What would you hope it would be? Arnold? Driven? Close to x. Close to, well, x is standing for random variable. So, a size of most fish. The mean? Yeah. Wouldn't it make sense, or wouldn't it be nice if the mean of this random variable was the same as the mean of this one? After all, this is just the average of these guys. 
doesn't it kind of make sense that its mean would be the same as the mean of the random variable? We don't know that yet, but that's kind of our gut feel. What about the distribution, the shape of it? If my original x looked like this, what do you think x bar distribution looked like? Well, let, me, let me help you think this through. Suppose I was studying heights of cadets in this room. And it'll take each row as a sample. Suppose I took everybody's height here, took the mean. Everybody's height there, the mean, and the mean, and the mean, four times. Now, if you look over your cells, you know, we've got heights going up and down, and up and down, and up and down. There's a standard deviation of heights when I look at you one at a time. Compare that number, that deviation of heights one at a time with the deviation of heights if I looked at you an average of a row at a time. Which do you think would be bigger, or would they be the same? Well, certainly each row is going to be different, but what's the, what would the tendency be? If I looked at the, the heights in your row here, and compared to the heights of the second row, the third row, and the fourth row, and I'm looking at those differences, which is the standard deviation, and it's a measure of how much things fluctuate, what would have the most variance? Looking at heights person by person, or looking at heights row by row, where the rows are average? Yeah, makes sense, doesn't it? Because what happens when I average things over a row? Yeah, I kind of get it smoothed out, don't I? Yeah. So our guess would be, and these are guesses so far, that the mean of this distribution is the same as the mean of this one. But what's its shape going to be? Well, if the standard deviation is smaller, the shape is going to be, come on, huh? Taller and wider or narrower? Narrower. Now, is that good or bad? Does that make me happy or does that make me sad? Does it make you happy or sad? It's good. He's happy. Why? There is less variance. Why is that a good thing? Because your estimate will be more accurate. Sure. Remember, my goal in all this is to get an estimate of something that I don't know. I like to get an estimate of this guy up here, my mu. And what do I have to, to estimate if I have these guys down here? Well, if I can get a situation where their distribution is nice and narrow, then, and, this is all the wishful thinking here, and if their mean is the same as this mean, then I can be guaranteed I've got a pretty good estimate. Following the logic here? So that would be great if that would happen. And you know what? It does happen. That's the central limit theorem. Let's see if I can find it here. Nope, it's on another slide. I'll write it down. Actually, I know where it came from.
here we are. I usually ask for a drum roll at this point. And now for the central limit there. I'll have a dramatic reading of the central limit there. For a population with any distribution, come back to the other line words in a minute, any distribution, because they're important. The distribution of the sample means approaches a normal distribution. Two more underlying words, really important. As the sample size increases, in addition, if the original population has a mean of mu and a standard deviation sigma, then mu of x bar equals mu. That's what our intuition told us, and it's true. Mu of x bar is mu. And look what happens here. Sigma x bar, the standard deviation of the sample means, is the standard deviation of the original distribution divided by the square root of n. So what happens as my sample size gets larger? What's going to happen to the shape of the curve that I erase? It's going to get narrower and narrower and narrower. What's that say about the accuracy of my estimate as my sample size increases? It gets better and better and better. Fantastic. That's mathematical proof of what seems kind of obvious. If I take larger and larger sample sizes, I'll get better and better estimates. But this is the, tells me exactly how, how accurate they're going to be. Now let's go through and look at some of these words again. Any distribution. I'm going to do a little applet here in a minute that demonstrates this. Any distribution. I drew a normal curve up here originally, but that's not a requirement. You could start out with a uniform distribution. You could start out with a chi-square, a t distribution, an f distribution. It doesn't matter. All that's required is that it have a mean and a finite standard deviation. If that's true, then the central limit still holds. So we're not restricted just to normal distributions. We can work with any distribution. The distribution of sample means approaches a normal distribution. Okay, so what's this approach mean? Well, it gets closer and closer to, doesn't it? Now, in mathematics, we wouldn't let that slip closer and closer to. There's a very precise definition, but it involves limits and epsilons and deltas. Just know this, that we'll come up with a rule of thumb, some practical guidance, when your sample size is large enough, pretty much ensure you that you've approached a normal distribution, you've gotten close. There are certain circumstances when I can guarantee you you'll have a normal distribution, but if the sample size is large enough, you will have approached it close enough that we'll use the normal distribution. And then, and finally, mu of x bar is mu, sigma x bar is sigma over the square root of 10. All right, let's, uh, Java app that I want to show you. So I'll just search for it and find it.
Yes. Oh. Apologize for the delay here. I'm going to download Java. I'll see that it's up and running the next time. My apologies, but here's here's what it means graphically. Uh, I'll make this a little more for the next time. And this is why the central limit theorem is so amazing and makes my top ten list. So far, we've looked at, I've been drawing pictures of normal distributions. So over here is the distribution of x, and this over here is the distribution of x bar, the sample means. And the central limit theorem tells us that something like this is happening. That if I start out with a normal curve, my distribution of the sample means is also normal. That's not too surprising. It has the same mean. That's not too surprising either. But the really good news is sigma x bar is sigma over the square root of n. <coughs> well, what if I started out with a uniform distribution? A shape that looks like that. If I sample from a uniform distribution and I look at the means, the central limit theorem tells me that the distribution of the sample means will also have this shape. So I'm going from a rectangle to a normal curve. The central limit theorem tells me if I start out with a curve that's bimodal like this, and I sample from it and calculate the means, that the distribution of its sample means will also be a normal distribution. Any old shape you can think of for a probability distribution, as long as it meets a few requirements, it's got to have a finite variance and a mean, and area under the curve is one. Anything you can draw that meets those requirements, you can be guaranteed that its distribution of sample means is it approaches a normal distribution. How could that be? Why is it that everything, when you take averages and samples, wants to be normal? I don't have the answer to that, but that's just the way the universe works. So how are we going to use this? You might be asking that question right now. Well, let's think about how we could use it. We'll go back to our example of uh, of studying those, those fish. So x is equal to the weight of <coughs> one pass, and that's my random variable. And I don't know what its distribution is. It probably is normal. It could be normal. But it really doesn't matter for the central limit there. And x bar is going to be the mean weight of 10. And I know that these have a mu and a sigma. So my n in this case, my sample size is 10. What is my the mean of x bar? 
the essential limit thing tells me the mean of x bar is just the mean of this guy. And it tells me that <coughs> sigma x bar is sigma over the square root of n. Alright, well how could I use this? If I had, I'll step back a bit and say that this mu is equal to uh, 2.5 pounds and this sigma is equal to 0.5. What's the central limit theory tell me about the distribution of the sampling means? Well, it says it has a mean of 2.5. But what about its standard deviation? It's 0.5 over the square root of n. And I said we're doing, what, 10 here? So someone take your calculator out and get that for me, sigma x bar. Six. So the standard deviation went all the way down from 0.5 to 0.16. So I have a normal distribution, or at least I'm approaching a normal distribution, with a mean of 2.5 and a sigma equal to 0.16. So now I can ask some questions. Well, what's the probability then that I would get an x bar between 2.5 and 3? That my sample mean would be between 2.5 and 3 pounds. Well, we know how to solve that, don't we? That's normal CDF, left, right. U sigma. So the probability is down here. Normal CDF 2.53. Someone please punch this in. 2.5 and 0.16. Point five. Point five. Yeah, I guess that makes sense, doesn't it? Why does that make sense? Because the the um, standard deviation is so small. <laughs> exactly. This is the standard deviation is just point one six. So if in my sample my sample size 10, between 2.5 and 3, that's a lot of standard deviations, isn't it? So I'm, I'm well out there, and I practically have half of the normal curve, so the probability is going to be about 0.5. All right.
not been a good day for the smart classroom. The smart classroom hasn't been so smart. the IT folks for help. Yeah. I think that's where I'm going to stop for today. And I'll try hard to get this demo working for Wednesday.